Oh, dear uh, friends, colleagues, uh, welcome for the second day of our uh, conference, and uh, which uh, we start uh, immediately from the paper by uh, Frank Ruda, whom I am happy to uh, introduce. He is an interim professor for philosophy of audiovisual media at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. He's also a visiting lecturer at BART, a liberal arts college in Berlin, and um, at the Institute for Philosophy at the Academy of Art and Science, um, Ljubljana, Slovenia. His publications include uh, Hegel's Rebel, an investigation into Hegel's philosophy of right. Uh, continuum, uh, 2011, for Badiou, Idealism Without Idealism, Northwestern University Press, uh, 2015, and Abolition Freedom, a plea for the contemporary use of fatalism, Nebraska University Press, 2015. Uh, and I am um, happy to, uh, his paper will be called In Humanism, a Manifesto. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you, Kitty, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. I will today present a manifesto of inhumanism. The surprise may be it was not written by me. Um, it's emerged in a, as a contribution to a very harsh debate in the 16th century between Desiderius Erasmus and Martin Luther. Martin Luther's De Servo Arbitrio, uh, On the Unfreedom of the Will, a title that he took from St. Augustine, presents to my mind precisely such a manifesto. I will argue for that right now. In 1525, Luther answered <clears throat> Erasmus' critique of his position. His reply was so drastic that Erasmus responded, you plunge the whole world into fatal discord. The point of dispute was the existence of free choice as essence of human beings. Erasmus opted for, Luther against it. Thereby, Luther took a firm stance against any form of Aristotelianism that derives its concept of justice from a human, namely ontic context, where it normatively describes the appropriate way of acting and applies it to the ontological doctrine of God. Oh, yeah. Aristotelians believe <clears throat> that human beings can contribute to their salvation by means of good works because God shares our normative standards of justice and reason. Simply put, there is a continuity between man and God. Luther objects that thereby they derive an image of God from the human realm grounded in the assumptions that humans are free. Against this position, he contends that God works in us even against our will which is why true faith never begins with a free choice, but with a forced reorientation of one's life. Believing is not the actualization of the human capacity. Its origin, as well as its direction, is God. The advent of faith is a fundamental break in one's life because it implies to quit relying on good reasons, normative, or objective capacity. Faith, I quote a guy called Hans-Peter Maurer, who wrote an amazing book on Luther, faith begins only where the illusion of a remote inner world is disturbed. Luther is not only Augustinian, but deeply Paulinian. There is no inner realm of freedom to rely on in matters of faith. Rather, again Maurer, my inner approaches me radically from the outer, unquote. I only experience faith when I encounter God and are forced to renew myself. This is why anyone who thinks he's free in matters of faith and who believes deliberately decided action actions manifest as freedom is ultimately an Aristotelian non-believer. In true faith, one encounters an abyss of despair as one traverses the illusion that one has anything objectively given at one's disposal. One learns to break with the idea of freedom as something one possesses. Nothing guarantees salvation, not even incessant striving for good works, quite the contrary. Because one still presumes that one's work, works can influence God's judgment and there is a common measure, one ends up in blasphemy. Free is who does not identify freedom with a given capacity, but who begins experiencing the despair that there is nothing one can do to achieve what one strives for. One does not even know how to strive in the right direction. This is a precondition for encountering God, which forces one to believe. Maurer, 
Where such an event happens, a fresh breeze overthrows my life, unquote. Faith emerges as an event. It results from encountering something <clears throat> that one would not have believed to be possible before experiencing it. And it is not possible, at least not for ourselves or for oneself, one does not have the freedom to believe. Freedom is rather that which after an event of faith becomes absolutely necessary for me, although it strikes me contingently. For me, it seems ungrounded, it solely depends on God's will. What results from it is absolutely necessary as it forces me to believe and I have no power against God's will. Freedom of belief results from an event of grace which exceeds any human capacity. Franz Rosenzweig rightly stated that Luther's believer, quote, has neither belief nor unbelief, but both happen to him, unquote. Hence, no free will. Erasmus was discontent with Luther's radicalism as he considered free will to be the precondition for all, of all relig religiosity. If you were in the hands of a predestinating God, mankind would be a mere object, neither responsible nor guilty, never achieving anything on its own. He therefore vindicated a certain power of freedom, this is Erasmus, but also granted that scripture contains, quote, secret places into which God has not wanted us to penetrate more deeply, unquote. Freedom of the will is one of these places. So if God wants more, uh, some things to remain unknown to us until we die and or the day of last judgment comes, quote Erasmus, it is more religious to worship them being unknown than to discuss them being insoluble, unquote. Luther therefore generates confusion and disorientation, ultimately amorality and an irrel irreligious attitude. This is why Erasmus tried not to radically take sides for or against free will, but rather played the role of a neutral referee taking sides against taking sides. Against Luther, right? Second part, letting God be good. Erasmus claims that scripture is ambiguous and can be used for and against free will. He also claims that one has to avoid questioning, questioning its consistency as thereby the basis of faith and morality starts to teeter. He proposes to call freedom, quote, a power of the human will by which a man can apply himself to the things which lead to eternal salvation or turn away from them, unquote. Freedom is a capacity that has a certain efficacy, neither a lot nor none. For example, why did Adam sin? Because he was able to. And because, quote Erasmus, his will seemed to have been corrupted by immoderate love towards his spouse. So, immoderation, excess, is sin. Weirdly, this makes God a jealous creature, right? I mean, don't love anyone more than me. So he's the partner you don't want to have. But a moderate reading of scripture argues that even the immoderation of original sin only obscured, as he puts it, and did not extinguish free will. It made free will tend to sin, yet, complicated quote by Erasmus, by the grace of God, when sin has been forgiven, the will is made free to the extent that, even apart from the help of new grace, it could attain eternal life. So it is possible for man, with the help of divine grace, which always accompanies human effort, to continue in the right, yet not without a tendency to sin, owing to the vestiges of original sin in him. Which basically means, sort of, it can work. Original sin contaminates our capacity, but we're able to strive for salvation and attain it with God's help. To specify this, Erasmus introduces three kinds of laws. The law of nature, of good works, and of faith. The first functions like a trivialized or banalized categorical imperative. It's, quote, declares it to be a crime if any does to another what he would not wish done to himself, unquote. The second law of good works issues commands and sanctions that exceed our power but can be met with the help of God. Finally, the law of faith commands impossible things, but, quote Erasmus, because grace is plentifully added to it, not only does it make things easy, which of themselves are impossible, it makes them also agreeable, unquote. This is a gradual exposition of how freedom contributes to salvation. We can, law of nature, avoid doing to others what we do not want to be done to us. Freedom is firstly a capacity to avoid. Additionally, we should also strive to follow God's commandment, law of good works, but these exceed our capacity. Freedom comes with an insight into one's limitations. 
finally, with divine help, law of faith, we can do what we're incapable of doing by our nature, but striving for good, work, good works is not futile, it is a precondition of salvation. This is human divine cooperationism. This is the idea. And my suggestion would be it's a crucial attribute of humanism, cooperationism. We anyhow only have <clears throat> the capacity to follow natural law because divine grace has already intervened after original sin and almost fully reconstituted our capacity. The law of faith is always already in effect. It always accompanies human effort and therefore logically precedes the law of nature. The law of faith, faith is the invisible bracket written around the set, set of three laws. And God therein is the unmoved mover which out of mercy enables us to circle around him. Super Aristotelianism, right? Thereby mankind stands in a continual relationship with God. We always already are indebted to God. We owe him. Not uninteresting, I think. Without whom we could do nothing. But he must be thought of as separated from all evil that we perform. Evil is a misuse of the capacity that we owe to God's mercy. A shitty investment. Let's put it like that. Yet, he is eternally good. For Erasmus, his goodness is linked to four kinds of grace. First, one that is granted naturally, our free will as natural capacity. Second, one that has an extraordinary status, that is operative grace, and provides an occasion to change one's life. Right? You get a, something nice happens and you take it. One that emerges when the offer of operative grace is accepted, cooperative grace, then you accept the offer that God made. And one that is linked to achieving the goal that emerged through the offer. Truly cooperative grace. So there is a chance, you take it, God helps you, and you attain what you strive for. Um, the absolutely disgusting uh, 2006 Hollywood movie, Pursuit of Happiness, is a good example of that. Will Smith. Um, he was given an offer at a shitty firm. He takes it, works hard. And at the end, he attains what he wants, money. I take this to formulate one basic feature of humanism. In short, our natural constitution entails the capacity, natural grace, to accept an invitation, operative grace, to effectively strive for good works that otherwise we are incapable of, cooperative grace, but can be realized if God helps us, truly cooperative grace. Human nature was equipped by God to work with him if he reaches out to us. This is why, quote Erasmus, no sinner ought ever to be secure, none ought despair, unquote. If there were no free will, we could not work for God's mercy. Without freedom, the whole religious realm would collapse, no grace, no responsibility, no sin, no commandments. God would simply be playing dirty games with us. One can thus see that the debate between Erasmus and Luther ultimately revolves around the proper causality of grace and freedom as essence of a human being or essence of the human condition. This is what is at stake with Luther's doctrine of divine foreknowledge and predestination, which therefore Erasmus has to refute. He seeks to defend free will without limiting God's power or spoiling his omnipotence. He therefore conceptually distinguishes divine foreknowledge from predetermination. How? By arguing that we also know that some things will happen in the future, say a solar eclipse, but they do not happen because we know them, but vice versa. The same holds for divine foreknowledge for, for uh, Erasmus. Thereby, he also introduces a distinction between two types of necessity, namely antecedent, that predetermines the free will, and consequent, after the fact necessity. With consequent necessity, one can, according to Erasmus, still account for guilt, sin, merit, and human responsibility. Without it, God's punishment would be, quote, either mad or cruel. He would madly or cruelly throw a powerless sinner, quote again, guilty of nothing into eternal fire, unquote. Good would not be, God would not be good, but a sadist. Mankind would be his nasty object, and the world would ultimately turn out to be one gigantic stage for a sadistic play that even lacks the proper quality of tragedy. A good God punishes only someone who deliberately violates the law of nature or of good works, and may even hate him in advance, as he foresees, say, the criminal eclipse, as we foresee the solar one. Yet for Erasmus, it is crucial to emphasize that we're not just vessels in God's predetermining hands. We are, as he argues with Aristotle, God's servants. When servants obey their masters, 
They are active and the works they generate are also theirs. Just like them, we cause our good, just like them, we cause our good works, even though they depend on God's grace. But, quote, he who turns does not immediately coerce the mind, unquote. Although God, of course, could coerce. Erasmus expounds the causality of human actions as follows. First there's thinking, then willing, finally doing. There is no free will in thinking and doing. Both are caused by God's grace, but a deliberate act of will, consent of the agent, necessarily mediates thought with action. He makes you think something, then you have to consent to it, and then from this follows an action that depends on God. God is thereby taking his main cause of an action, yet free will is a necessary secondary cause, a causal cooperation leaving room for freedom. This is why for Erasmus, a true believer is able to accomplish some things, but ascribes everything to God, his master and guide. He would, for example, say, he blessed me with nice children or something like that, although it's quite clear that he needed to fuck to produce them, right? Human nature entails the capacity of free will, but humans are never the sole authors of their actions, as even their nature depends on God. From this, Erasmus develops an ontological claim about the nature of all things. Everything has a beginning, progresses, and ends. The first and the last fully depend on God. The capacity to will springs from God's grace, and we can only cultivate, this is essential, cultivate our capacity by consenting to cooperate with him. He has always already reached out to us, God is a supportive and supporting cooperation partner in matters of human salvation. And I quote Erasmus, an advisor and helper, just as an architect helps his assistant, shows him the why and wherefore. What the architect is to the pupil, to his pupil, grace is to our will. There is nothing that man cannot do with the help of grace, of the grace of God. In short, he is a good, charming architect that enjoys helping and advising. Yet what to do with this, uh, with uh, the parts of his words, scripture, that suggest otherwise. In reading them, quote Erasmus, we are forced willy-nilly to seek some moderation of our opinion, unquote. So again, when there seems to be a contradiction in scripture, or it contradicts our idea of God better, there's a simple solution, quote, we shall be ordered to adore that which is not right to pursue, unquote. To adore what we cannot comprehend is crucial, yet what also is to be avoided is to, quote again, to overthrow free choice, for if this is done away with, I do not see any way in which the problem of the righteousness and the mercy of God is to be explained, unquote. If there were no freedom and only absolute necessity, as Luther, Luther will argue, one, quote, ascribes cruelty and injustice to God, a sentiment offensive to pious ears, for he would not be God if there were found in him any blemish or imperfection, unquote. Evil has to remain external to to the notion of God. When man is considered and capable of anything, God becomes, a cruel, becomes cruel and imperfect too, since he is the one responsible for evil. In other words, for Luther, Erasmus's God is dead. There is only a cruel supreme sadist issuing commands that are impossible to fulfill and a human nature so weak it can achieve nothing on its own. For Erasmus, this, quote, immeasurably exaggerates original sin. It implies an excess of zeal and a delight in extravagant statements, unquote. And it is, quote again, such exaggerated views that have been born the thunders and lightnings which now shake the world. Peasant rebellion, right? Um, paradoxes on account of which the Christian world is now in uproar. In short, Luther is excessive, extravagant, and exaggerates. He brings conflict, despair, and fatalism over the entire human race. He's an inhumanist, defending what Lee Gaddis once called a pessimistic anthropology and an apocalyptic perspective. Against this one needs moderation, reasonable interpretation, and a humanist theory of cooperation. The fate of not only the Christian, of the world depends on that. Third part, exaggerating exagger exaggerations or letting God be God. Erasmus' position follows the implicit imperative, let God be good. Luther opposes it with his own, namely, let God be God. If Erasmus argues that Luther exaggerates, one should here recall what Adorno once claimed about psychoanalysis. In psychoanalysis, nothing is true except the exagger exaggerations. The same, I want to argue, holds for Luther. 
It is precisely his exaggerations, his defense of absolute necessity of predestination, and his radical disidentification of freedom and capacity that, as I will argue, touch on a crucial dimension of a radical concept of freedom and the human. Why? Because neglecting the pejorative connotation of exaggeration whose converse would be appropriateness, he who exaggerates literally goes beyond a certain limit and produces something excessive. Such an access is at stake with Luther's exaggerations. I thus take Erasmus' critique as an entry point into Luther. This is justified as Luther himself contends that Erasmus forced him to even exaggerate his previous, previous exaggerations. So what he does is exaggerating exaggerations excessively. Peculiarly and provocatively, Luther also contends that this redoubled and excessive exaggeration, maybe even meta-exaggeration, generated later clarity in his own position. I have a quote, but I don't read it. An exaggeration without measure, immeasurably excessive, that ultimately coincides with absolute clarity. Clarity of his position, right? This is the idea. How to understand this? In his, what uh, Benjamin Warfield once called Manifesto for Reformation, Luther demonstrates the inconsistency of Erasmus' position through a close reading of his text that depicts its necessary yet involuntary outcome. He drives him straight into the arms of Pelagius, uh, who contended a primacy of free will over the omnipotence uh, of gods and grace. One here witnesses the practice, the practice of absolute necessity. One should thus read Luther as Hegelian avant la lettre, taking the claims of a position seriously by showing how the assumptions on which they rely lead to the very opposite of what the position wanted to assert. And, of course, Hegel was a Lutheran his whole life, right? Against Erasmus, Luther not only seeks to defend absolute necessity, but also the absolute clarity of scripture. It is eternally clear, i.e. non-contradictory, and it is externally clear, i.e. can be understood by any true believer. Why should God have given it to us otherwise? This is basically his point. The two are internally linked. Scripture is clear under the condition that only with the right spirit it can be adequately comprehended and hence demands the spirit that demonstrates it, its internal clarity. Thereby you have a sort of tautological loop which is the structure of uh, uh, absolute necessity. There, there, that there are ambiguous parts of scripture that should not be investigated is therefore already a symptom of an untrue believer. No true belief without clarity of scripture. No clarity of scripture without true belief. This is derived from reading scripture to the latter. So if something is paradoxical in scripture, it's not contradictory, but scripture is absolutely clear that there is something paradoxical that needs to be unfolded, for example. <clears throat> this is why for Luther, Erasmus argues like a sophist. He's a wordy rhet rhetorician, a fluent orator, bending God's words, introducing allegedly subtle but ultimately worthless distinctions. He can, for example, not explain why, the, why there is a trope in scripture, but he always alludes to it. But Luther argues one needs to prove the absolute necessity why in God's word there is a trope, right? Otherwise one doesn't understand it. Luther in general despises the idea that certain things should not be discussed publicly when it comes to matters of faith. He detests such self-censorship of preachers. And, I quote uh, Luther, if it is wrong, why do you, Erasmus, do it? I mean, if it should not be discussed, why does he discuss it? That it should not be discussed, right? I mean, this is the Hegelian approach I was talking about. But the true problem is that, quote, you treat this subject, you, Erasmus, as if it were simply an affair between you and me about the recovery of a sum of money, unquote. This sort of bookkeeping does not work in matters of faith and freedom. Erasmus, the bookkeeper, wants to prevent turmoil in the world, but just demonstrates his ignorance towards two true questions of faith. Luther asserts in a proto-Leninist manner that, quote, even we are not made of stone, but when nothing else can be done, we prefer to be battered with temporal tumult, rejoicing in the grace of God for the sake of the world of God. To lament upheavals is useless, as they did not spring from debates about scripture, scripture, but have, quote again, arisen and are directed from above and will not cease till the adversaries of the world are mud in the streets. He talks about the Pope, right? This is the brutal 
uh, aspect. Also, I should mention somehow, Luther is in some sense an ordinary language philosopher because he simply says, let's take a look at what there is, whereas Erasmus is a postmodernist of Ona Lettre. Uh, uh, um, Luther uh, uh, characterizes that by saying, uh, for him, anything can, might be made of anything. So, I mean, this is the feuilleton, right, classification of postmodern. Luther here argues it is always worth to risk bloodshed in matters of faith, since the opera on the street is a symptom of a transformation of it. This means that they sprung from God's will, and his, quote, operations are not childish or bourgeois or human, but divine and exceed human grasp. One can here get a sense of Luther's radicalism. Turning against God's will and his predestination, one acts childish or bourgeois or simply all too human. In short, one becomes a bourgeois, a humanist, if one opts for free will as something that humans have as a capacity. Erasmus is for Luther not only a moderate bourgeois politician who seeks to negotiate a peace treaty with the world as it is. He also takes sides with human dogmas and against God since peace is not a concept applicable to God. This is the first move of blasphemy. This ultimately means Erasmus opts for human worldly freedom and against freedom of and in faith, for unfreedom, in short, against true freedom. Since God does not act in accordance with human dogmas, he is no moderator who corrects our worldly performances, trying to make us more skillful servants. And he who believes to correct his ways all by himself is for Luther nothing but, quote, a hypocrite, unquote. The first thing one has to assert thus is that without God, we are fundamentally helpless, and this is our fate. Only, quote, the elect and the godly will be corrected by the Holy Spirit, while the rest perish uncorrected, unquote. One should thus not assume that God always has reached out to us. Quote, in divine things, the wonder is, rather, if there are one or two who are not blind, but it is no wonder if all without exception are blind, unquote. An event of grace is rare and exceptional and defies all laws of probability, mea su avant la lettre. If one believes otherwise, one, quote, retains some self-confidence and does not altogether despair of oneself and at least hopes or desires that there may be, unquote, a chance of salvation. Without despair, there will never be salvation. This is Luther's point. Luther himself describes this experience as follows, quote, I myself was offended more than once and brought to the very depth and abyss of despair, angst, so that I wished I had never been created a man, Sophocles, before I realized how salutary that despair was and how near to grace, unquote. Without completely abandoning all hope, there can never be an event of grace for Luther. Otherwise, one still retains some objective ground, some reasons to believe. But belief is radically non-objective, and there are never good reasons for it. This is why it means that it originates in an event of grace. In short, no love of God without prior despair, no love as long as there is still hope. Otherwise, I could decide to love and believe in God. But with the love of God, one can argue, it is as with all true love. One cannot and does not decide to fall in love. This is why I fall, one falls in love, even if I later can decide to get married or do whatsoever, move in together by a dog. Love happens to me, and the precondition for such an event is to get rid of all self-confidence, hope and desire to fall in love. Why? Because as long as I desire in and hope for it, I consider it to be possible. But, and this is Luther's point, an event of grace from which love emerges exceeds human grasp, and this means it can only be thought as being impossible, in simpler terms, after the fact. An event of grace is thus then when the impossible qua impossible happens. And the true question that here emerges, does the impossible happen necessarily or contingently? And predestination is the answer to that, right? It is impossible, but it happens necessarily, absolutely necessarily. Um, precise definition of what one could, in different terms, call the real. One may, first, one may first answer that salvation as much as love is conceptually linked to an experience of utter passivity, sheer passivity, passive necessity of God's working. This is what Luther calls it. Something happens that I'm unable to willfully provoke. 
This experience is anticipated in the experience of despair and anxiety that arises from the insight that salvation rightly understood is impossible. One touches upon this impossible point when reaching the abyss of despair, and thereby there's a moment movement of torsion that makes despair salutary. It twists around. You get rid of all worldly attachments. Later, the Marxist tradition will call this self-criticism. It results is that any its result is that any true believer is, I quote Rainer Schumann, thus anguished at its at his roots. Unquote. What is this anguish? It is what springs from the impossibility of salvation and from the assumption that there would never will be any chance for us to experience God's mercy. But does this not abolish faith? Luther answers no. True faith begins where we, I quote, I love this, believe God merciful when he saves so few and damns so many, and to believe him righteous when he, by his own will, he makes us necessarily damnable so that he seems, according to Erasmus, worthy of hatred rather than love, unquote. True faith, faith begins believing what has no objective ground, assuming the worst already happened, experiencing anxiety, and there, that there is nothing we, can, uh, we could cling to. Faith begins with loving who brings this fate over us. The first imperative of true belief is thus, love only him and unconditionally love him or her who makes you anxious. But what to do then with the question of why God punishes someone if by his own will he is forced to do evil? Here we get Luther's account of the concept of necessity. He distinguishes between necessity, necessitas immutabilitas, immutabilitatis, and compulsion, necessitas coactionis. When someone without the spirit of God, as he puts it, wills evil, he does so by his own accord. He's not compelled, although he has no capacity to change the direction uh, uh, to which his will tends. The nature of our will immutably turns to e toward evil. The result from, uh, this results from original sin. There is a, quote, persistent attraction and drive of the will toward evil. Evil, thereby, is simply defined by turning away from God. This is why there is no free choice, yet no, no simple compulsion either. If we emphasize the existence of free will, we do not know what we do. We claim to be free, yet freedom just enforces our fate and makes us assume that we do not need God because we're free. Not only are we not free in our choices, the freedom we defend immutably thrives on evil. But why can't say through the help of commandments, we not resist this tendency and strive for the good, although we need grace to achieve it? Luther answers, trying to resist its own nature, the will is driven into even worse evil. This is the trick, right? You have a will, but it's completely clear in which direction it goes. It always tends towards evil. And if you try to change it, you use the very capacity that you try to change, and things get worse. <clears throat> Trying to resist its own nature, the will is driven into even worse evil, as self-confidence and self-righteousness emerge from the assumption that one is able to behave virtuously. The only capacity mankind has is a capacity to do evil, and there is no, re no resistance to it. We're incapable of freely redetermining ourselves, our nature, for in this very act, we would have to rely on the very capacity which we seek to redetermine. In short, freedom as capacity is not freedom. It is rather wonderful definition, in all man the kingdom of Satan, unquote. It does not even, uh, quote again, cease to be evil under the movement of God. So it's not a complete change of nature. Right? It is always already contaminated by the immutability of its own nature. But this does not exclude responsibility or sin. Rather, as Luther argues, one is even more responsible for that which one cannot change, which is why God is always already justified in condemning us. It's like when Freud is... Uh, arguing, um, um, basically, that we're still responsible for what we dream, right? We didn't fabricate the dream consciously, but who the fuck else did it, when, if not us, right? So it's not uh, in our power to change it, but nonetheless, of course, we're the only ones responsible. He works evil in us, i.e. by means not uh, through, any of, uh, through any fault of his, we're just like also wonderful, a horse that is lame in one or two of its feet, which unless, is, even if it's cured, goes badly. Also, one should never forget, I quote again, God owes us 
owes us nothing, unquote, and he does not, quote again, act according to human justice or else ceases to be God. Fourth part, a firm and declared predestination. For Luther, Erasmus arrives at the same conclusion even if involuntarily. I mean, he must argue that, right? If, God works, if good works depend on God's cooperation, the free will is not free, and everything depends on divine grace. For, quote Luther, what is ineffective power, but simply no power at all. Erasmus misuses language and identifies what he does in language with the thing itself, so he's slightly psychotic, and asserts what he wants to deny. He, I quote, is compelled to speak for us and against himself, unquote. He speaks of a certain existence of free choice, yet is forced to admit its inexistence. He obscures the sense of scripture, just as he himself claims original sin obscured our free will, and he conflates the name of the thing with the thing itself. The only thing that may orient our belief in is the word of God, incarnated, the word became, uh, became flesh in scripture, and this word is absolutely clear. Otherwise, men, quote Luther, fabricate whatever they please, unquote. One way of this fabrication of Erasmus consists in, quote, collating everything, comparing everything, and affirming nothing, unquote. But faith essentially only exists through affirmation and declaration, apophasis, and not collation, diatribe. This is a uh, di diatribe. This is the idea. This is the, the title of uh, Erasmus, Erasmus uh, book. So even the title is already an indication that it's all fucked up. No faith without taking sides. Why this is nonetheless consistent is because he fully embraces Luther, uh, sorry, here a paradox emerges, namely that Luther takes sides against the capacity of freely, uh, of deliberate choosing. Why this is nonetheless consistent is because he fully embraces the idea of being impelled to do so. He thereby affirms his own incapacity to do otherwise, a repetition of the infamous, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. This I write, I cannot do otherwise. If there were free choice, one must attribute everything to it and hence divinize it, which means there is only free will, no God, no absolute. If there is God, there is no free will and everything depends on grace. This is thus one of, one of the necessary and fundamental forced choices of any true belief to accept that there is no true choice. You see, this is... Erasmus seeks to avoid this by emphasizing a true choice without force, but his moderation leads him to defend a, quote, crippled free choice, depending on grace, that at the same time he deifies. This is the contradiction. He needs to ascribe everything to it, and at the same time it somehow depends on grace. There is free choice, <clears throat> for Luther, there is free choice, but only in God, on whom everything depends, hence no freedom of will. And as God's will is not caused ex externally, what he willed must be absolutely necessary and immutably. In other words, for his will there is no cause. This is Luther. God is the only cause, and there cannot be a cause of the cause. There is no other of the other. If his will is immutable and necessary, God willed what he willed for eternity, quote Luther, even before the foundation of the world. And so also his, quote, love and hatred is eternal being prior to the creation of the world. This is why there is predestination. This is also why, if he does not will it, his commandments cannot be fulfilled by us. They exist only for us to have the undeniable experience of how incapable we are. The law, just, uh, the law thus generates knowledge of one's own incapacity and impotence. Commandments produce knowledge of the fact that there is no free will. This knowledge is knowledge of the impossibility of attaining salvation by one's own efforts. It is thereby also knowledge of a difference that differs from all difference, differences one encounters in the world. It implies the affirmation that there is no common measure that relates God and mankind. He's so different, he cannot be uh, uh, attained or thought through a concept of worldly difference. Erasmus falsely assumes a continuity and thereby also confuses God preached and God hidden. It is precisely this distinction, in Hegelian terms, God for us and God in himself, that needs to be taken into account. God is not his word. The word is God revealed to mankind. To think God, one needs to avoid the temptation of fusing revelation, the word and Christ, and God as such. One needs to resist the temptation to make one 
out of them, as Erasmus does. Forgetting this difference, one starts to search for reasons behind God's will. This is the true problem. But as Luther contends, God's will is, quote, is not business of ours, unquote. Which is why we have only to stick, uh, we have to stick only to what was revealed to us, namely his word. This implies one needs to absolutely resist speculating about, about God's motives. There is a radical gap, a difference different from all other difference, separating the revealed God, scripture, and God in himself, the hidden or what's beautifully uh, Luther also calls the naked God. This split needs to be thought to not, quote, measure God by human reason, which literally is, quote, perverse, unquote, and resonates in Erasmus, quote again, thoroughly perverse use of language, unquote, that makes him, quote, a perverter of scripture. It's a shitty version of daddy you get with Erasmus, right? It's a perversion. God in himself exceeds human grasp and is thus necessarily unthinkable. One needs to think him as that which we cannot think. One can only think him as <clears throat> it seems by exaggeratingly exaggerating such that one comprehends how excessively different he is. If, quote, we can do nothing of things commanded, unquote, we encounter that even his revelation is in excess of our capacities. Quote, works of God are entirely beyond description. So there, even the commandments are excessive, and there, there, there is, a, let's say, an excess of the excess, something more infinite than infinite. Thereby we realize that the hidden part of God must even be in excess over this excess, a meta excess without measure. We can only fear and adore, this is Luther, since, quote, who are we that we should inquire into the cause of the divine will, unquote. In other words, the only thing to do with regard to the will of God is not to give a fuck about it. This is the only proper thing to do. Stop speculating. Do not care. This is the idea. Because you, everything else gets you completely obs uh, obsessed with what he wills. You ascribe meaning or whatever. We should not give a fuck about it since we can only relate to the will revealed to us, which is in short the will of Christ. This is what it means to let God uh, be God. The true believer thus acts with, quote, a will that is disinterested, not seeking any reward, being ready to uh, do good even if, an impossible supposition, there were neither kingdom nor hell. proto right? True belief implies disinterestedness in one's own salvation, which has to be considered to be impossible, to be attained by us anyhow. We will never find that out. Strictly different from Calvin. True belief puts, quote, a restraint on the rashness of reason. It prohibits to speculate about and seek meaning in what is impossible to think. Untrue belief indulges in, quote, useless speculations and questioning, questionings about our worthiness. This is the definition of Calvinism. Speculations into God's motives and rewards for our actions. It thereby understands an action only in relation to an object, namely the reward that re uh, comes, uh, that results from it. This is bookkeeping. The opposition to it is what motivates the logical prohibition to speculate in Luther, and it was thus frames his concept of predestination. There is predestination. We will never know what it is, so we should not care. Since, quote, we can do nothing of ourselves, and that whatever we do, God works in us, unquote, because he willed it. There will be reward only for those elected and punishment for all others, but as we have no influence on this, one should embrace the absolute, quote, necessity of immutability. True believers, quote, are not led by free choice, but by the spirit of God, and to be led is not to take the initiative, but to be impelled, unquote. In an event of great, God impels us, and we let go. We let be. This means that we act in such a manner that we're not agents of our own actions. This is clearly what offends human reason, which is why it is structurally indistinguishable from, quote, human stupidity. Reason is stupidity. Yet the elect, wonderful, see with God's eyes, which means that they also see themselves as God sees them, namely as unworthy, impotent, incapa incapacitated, despairing without him. That is to say, faith itself, which enables this paradoxical look, gaze, upon oneself that leads into utter despair, implies something impossible, namely God's perspective on us. And this very perspective also implies a foreknowledge of everything that will happen. In different terms, God knows what will happen, otherwise he could err or be deceived. 
God can only be God if he's, if, if he's considered to be absolutely omnipotent. And omnipotence does not mean, quote, the potentiality by which he could do many things which he does not, but the active power by which he pot potently works in all, unquote. Potential omnipotence would imply that he could intervene in the world but refrain from it. Only actual impotence, omnipotence, sorry, omnipotence, is real omnipotence, and real omnipotence is that he works everything in the world. Otherwise, I mean, it's like the discussion of potential and actual infinity. It refers to the, quote, unceasing activity of God in created things, unquote. If this is the case, it is clear that his omnipotence also implies that he necessarily does so and that everything is already always decided in advance. From this emerges, quote, the painful awareness that we're under necessity, unquote, that cannot but again fundamentally offend human reason. It is inhuman. We need to embrace our incapacity, lift it to the point of impossibility of salvation and despair, uh, of despair which flips around into having something solitary, since it is already, quote, written in the hearts of all alike that there is no such thing as free choice, unquote. So somehow we know. But we do not know that we know. Only through despair and the salubrity of faith we acquire an access, a belief for, uh, in the existence of this knowledge, one could say, a belief that there is something unconscious. Through despair and anxiety, we come close to know what we do not know that we know. One needs to embrace that all is always already lost, that this is our fate, and this and learn to love, and, and sorry, and uh, that uh, uh, God's love is indistinguishable uh, from our perspective, from hate. Erasmus and human reason, another human capacity, are basically Aristotelian since they assume an objective teleology that is always already at work and can be judged according to human norms. One thus needs to affirm the rationality for Luther of the irrational. One can begin affirming that, quote, free choice does many things, but these are nonetheless nothing in the sight of God. Eating, drinking, begetting, ruling are the nice examples. Ruling is the nicest I find. Eating, drinking, begetting, ruling. This is what free choice can do. But they're nothing from the perspective of God. I mean, they're not even actions. Ruling, governing. Ruling, yeah. One does need to affirm, uh, sorry, um, there's nothing in the sight of God, a sight that we can attain when we're truly believing. But when we lose sight of this sight, we assume human divine cooperation, nice, Luther, quote, division of labor, unquote, which makes faith into a gigantic capitalist enterprise, with God as its charming moderating boss, who even invites you for a drink from time to time, and with whom you work as well as you play squash. For Luther, to avoid capitalizing faith, capitalizing on faith, like the church at Luther's time already did, we need, quote, to prepare ourselves for the new creation of spirit, for a new birth or renewal, regeneration, transformation of the old man, born anew from God. This preparation, quite complex, which, quote, excludes preparation for grace, unquote. So it's a preparation without preparation somehow, because you cannot will it, right? Um, 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 needs to start from assuming what man wanted before the first creation, namely nothing, because it didn't exist. Man neither does nor attempts to do anything toward becoming a creature. This is Luther. So preparing to become a new creature of the kingdom of spirit, one also needs to assume that God will do it without us, being actively involved. The only preparation there is lies in the assumption that there will never be any salvation whatsoever, thus no preparation. You are prepared if you give, give up the idea that you could prepare. Since, quote, if grace comes from the predestination of God, it comes by necessity and not by our own effort. There is predestination, and this means that we have no influence on our fate, salvation, if it's not graciously granted um, as impossible, quite impossible, happening. And we have nothing in our power. Okay, three more minutes, sorry. Last part, religion as capitalism versus subtractive theology. Erasmus seeks a certain objective knowledge of God that makes him and us good. This is supposed to ensure human responsibility which must be grounded in a capacity, namely free will, as something belonging to human nature. He thus identifies freedom with 
with the capacity of choice that we have. For him, we already know, at least if we're told easily, and can rely on the objective fact that God is good and we are free. Humanism is objectivism. We can work for our salvation and earn it through good works. Erasmus proposes thus a theory of cultivization, cult cultivization of one's given objective capacity. Yet it tends to evil, but with discipline and punishment, one could say with Foucault, it can be made into a cooperative capacity which takes its chances and helps uh, to attain salvation. All should hope or even assume that they will be saved if they work for it and use their chances successfully. Grace is always possible and only those are guilty who do not cultivate their capacity or apply it unsuccessfully. So Erasmus' faith is a success story, right? It is. Um, Erasmus' theory is not only Aristotelian, it is not just cooper cooperationist. It's fundamentally a story of human success, in short, not of the American, but of the human dream. From the sinning dishwasher through cooperation to a salvational millionaire. Not capitalism as religion, but religion as capitalism. Against this, Luther holds that, quote, my salvation is out of my hand, unquote, that there is no chance of salvation, that all hope is futile. I have nothing in my power against this truth, and only God's exceptional grace may, if he predestined it so, save me. His, what I want to call subtractive theology, claims that one is here dealing not only with the wrong exceptionalism in Erasmus, all are guilty that do not, but with the wrong universalism, namely an objective one. Against it, he contends that not all are guilty because contingently God elected some of them. Think of the nice Johnny Cash song, The Man Who Comes Around. This is basically the structure, right? I mean, he just says, I don't give a fuck what you did, you're saved, you, you're not. So, against it, he contends, uh, sorry, this is not what can be said to be possible, but rather with, uh, with grace, the impossible happens qua impossible. This implies to deny free will and learn not to will, not even to will nothing. In humanism follows, in this sense, Luther, uh, Luther's in humanism follows Nietzsche's critique of the will. The insight into God's predestination and foreknowledge implies also to learn through faith how to inexist. I mean, right? You are in the same position as man prior to the first creation. So you learn how to not exist, how to, not, how to will not be, how to let be, as this is the human condition. One can in this claim feel the latent universalism of Luther, who asserts that anyone can be struck by the impossible event of grace if the impossible qua impossible happens, which is impossible, right? So it's no one and everyone at the same time. It is thus necessary to have faith, but impossible to do so in some sense, as it can only be brought about by God, and there is no relation between God and the human being. A being that is, I mean, this is the nice thing, um, when seen from the perspective of God, what, what does God see, right? Um, um, and Luther has this wonderful description or definition of the human being. Um, it is a piece of shit that fell, a piece of excrement, literally, a piece of excrement that fell out of God's anus. So, right, this is, and he looks, he looks into the bowl, uh, basically, and this is the world. Um, quite, quite charming. Um, the competitive religion of Calvin will not much later seek to turn this into a success story again by reintroducing constant speculations about God's will and the status of one's own salvation, as Max Weber has demonstrated. So you constantly try to figure out what you are for God, if you're a nice guy or whatever. So you work all the time. In Luther's subtractive and inhumanist theology, one confronts the necessary and yet impossible status of faith against any trivialization of God's decision, against any attempt of mine some meaning out of them. He defends the knowledge that something unknowable, unthinkable is, is at work within us. Luther's theology thus affirms a knowledge that we do not know that we have. His claim is that this can only happen through faith alone. Thereby, he does not only defend the inhuman kernel of human being, but he also comes very close to taking up, as Rainer Schürmann has shown in a wonderful book called Broken Hegemonies, uh, it's amazing, a Kantian position avant la lettre. He limits reason to make room for faith. Right? It's proto-Kantian. Ultimately, I think the greatest inhumanist of all, namely Hegel, will draw the most radical consequences from Luther, 
This is why I think Luth uh, Hegel was a Lutheran all his life. But this is another story. The necessary yet impossible next step is to then get from faith to the concept, from belief to another kind of knowledge, namely absolute knowing. But for now, I let things be. Um, thank you, Frank. Um, there are immediate questions. If not, I can. Um, okay, let's. Artemi. Yes, thank you. Uh, all of this is very persuasive, but uh, uh, there are two problems for me. First of all, the position of Luther in uh, the way you presented it, it doesn't sound Christian at all. This is not Christianity. This is maybe Judaism. It's actually, it actually sounds almost like Spinoza. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, it, it's kind of okay, but then... Uh, you lose uh, not simply the freedom of choice and capitalism, but you lose the principle of agency that would allow you to become a subject. So you lose the, the subjectivity, as, as appears to me. Unless you actually get uh, totally uh, anguished by this uh, uh, evil god, and you actually reject it. So there is also this possibility that through this excess, hyperbolic excess, God actually makes us uh, into rebels and makes us into atheists. Not atheists in the, in the sense that God is absent, but atheists in the sense that better know God than such a God. And this is what happened historically. Uh, so uh, uh, in this sense, yes, maybe, maybe this is prefer preferable to Erasmus, but precisely in this sense. Okay, um, I mean, it's not Christian in the orthodox sense, of course. It's not Catholicism, but it's Protestantism. And I think this is... Um, the interesting part, I find, is the radical absence of God from the world. I mean, this it's a world deprived of God, right? I mean, this is the world that Luther depicts. And hence, it's, I mean, the Deus absconditus. It is the God which is so absent, he cannot even be thought. And right now, I think you're completely right. I, I fundamentally agree, and this would be would be um, the necessary next step, um, and also why I refer to Hegel, because the danger is to turn that into a Spinozist ontology. Right? I completely see that, and everything depends on how one articulates what happens in an impossible event of grace. Let's put it in but use terms or so, what happens in subjectivization, right? So, and I think, I mean, Luther reintroduces freedom. And this is, is a part I left out. Because, I mean, three, three things I need to say. First thing is um, the, the grace of God can struck you whenever. And this has to do with Luther's idea of scripture and the word itself, because everyone becomes basically a priest, right? It's not the abolishment of the distinction, but everyone becomes an interpreter of scripture. And everyone can therefore basically explain scripture to you. And if someone explains scripture to you, and you understand it for the first time, uh, to speak uh, uh, a bit profanely, you understand it for the first time, you're struck by God somehow, right? So, I mean, if you... So... Um, so it can come from everywhere. And then the idea is what happens then is you get the understanding that all you can will. It's utmost contemporary finance form. So it's uh, uh, like the, there is a logic of debt which can uh, lie behind. So which uh, at, a, um, at a certain point exceeds uh, the limits of uh, the capacities of human uh, dialogue, understanding, and exchange. It exceeds uh, the logic of exchange. It uh, moves towards more like a battalion, let's say, logic of um, the gift, which you cannot pay back. Uh, and uh, like the debt is a kind of like you cannot pay uh, give, uh, a certain, you uh, cannot pay uh, back a certain gift 
of the capital itself. Uh, so you are infinitely in debt, and it does, the debt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what we see in, uh, in, uh, even in the uh, USA. Uh, so there is this interesting moment of uh, inhumanism of capitalism itself, which, uh, which I think is um, uh, worth to discuss. Uh, and uh, at this, uh, in this sense, maybe um, one of the options which could sound for me like somehow interesting, a part of, the, uh, of this debate of making capitalism human or inhuman with relation to God is like the, the other option, the romantic option, uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, the Dr. Faustus option of signing uh, a contract mm. with the, the devil. So the Hegelian idea of absolute knowing, uh, I think it, it's closer to the, uh, the knowledge, the knowledgeable idea is closer to this signing a contract. You give me the soul, I give you the money or something like this. Mm. So maybe, okay. I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, uh, yeah, that's most of the, this is what I wanted to say, is capitalism with a human face, right? I mean, this is the idea of religion as capitalism with a human face. Mm -hmm. So God is the nice partner and so forth. But I think what, what you're saying is completely valid for the Calvinist, Methodist, Jansenist even tradition, but not for Luther. Because we, God owes us nothing. We owe God nothing. He explodes the whole relation of any kind of exchange relationship. He explodes the idea of debt. I mean, we're not in debt, we're simply fucked. So, uh, right? I mean, we don't even know what the currency is in the hell hole we live, right? I mean, this is the problem. So, yeah, and, nice. and, and, if there, and if there is an event of grace, it's not like, yeah, he saved me, but what happens then is he completely annihilates me. Right? I mean, this is the idea. I become his vessel. This is literally what, what Luther says. And... So it's not like um, I'm the lucky one who won at the, let's say, solitary lottery or something like that. I mean, this is rather, again, Calvin, I would say. I mean, mm -hmm. just like buy uh, sufficient, I don't know, tickets, right? And mm -hmm. one may win and then you invest them and to buy even more. But uh, Luther radically thinks, I don't know, if you fall in love, you become a different person. So it's not like you say, yay, uh, all my fantasies are fulfilled. It's something happens that changes completely everything and you, and you, it's not like you acquire something like a bonus or something that's on your, on your solitary account or so. So, I mean, my, my suggestion, this is why I ended like that, is either capitalism with a human face or inhuman capitalism, uh, right, uh, uh, Calvin and, um, okay. or revolution. I mean, I, I, there is a nice, uh, quote in a very uh, completely bullshitty book by Stefan Zweig uh, on Erasmus, where he, is, this is quite nice, where he says uh, um, there is a series um, of things that happen for him in this debate. And it's like, uh, the one is moder moderate, the, un uh, the other is a, I don't know, fanatic and so forth. And he ends up by saying, in this debate, you also get two positions. The one is evolution, this is Erasmus, and the other is revolution. This is the only uh, sentence worth reading in the Zweig book, but I think he's right. Mm -hmm. So either capitalism with a human face, inhuman version of capitalism in the Calvinist, Methodist, even Janzelist tradition where God is the super debtor, right? Um, or the third option, which I think is nicer. Okay, uh, let's be as short as we can. Jan, uh, I have a... Uh, it's from the very beginning, Losha. I, I was making a, already before the first question, there was a line of people who were, yeah, so I, my, my, uh, I, I okay. see everything and I... Yeah. <laughs> you see everything? You you see everything? I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for if uh, someone is... God's uh, eye. So, um, yeah, 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 okay. Um, it's actually really short. I mean, I only have a short, uh, a small question on the... Uh, the place or the role of the bad guy in your, in your argument, because some, to, to, to some extent, I mean, the argument as you unfolded it has a part of a bad guy and a good guy, yeah. and the bad guy is Erasmus, yeah. somehow. And then comes Luther being the good guy yeah. and uh, uh, coming up with the notion of God, which is uh, precisely the collapse of good and bad, yeah. somehow. Yeah. So I wondered, I mean, like, and then also you said, like, okay, no love without despair. And somehow Erasmus is the despair for Luther, no? So you could say, actually, 
And then the next point would be to say, okay, Luther, what he proposes in your argument is that you're not able to willingful change the idea of the will because then you're trapped somehow. Mm. So what he cannot do exactly somehow to some point, Luther, I mean, is to change Erasmus, no? I mean, he can only... I mean, isn't one outcome of your argument that Luther can act actually, by reading Erasmus, only brutally repeat Erasmus? And the same argument, I put it in this nar narrative, but it's, it's meant conceptually, because you could like, go, go on and on, because Luther is actually... You, you didn't comment upon this, but he's reading scripture, no? I yeah. mean, scripture. Is scripture not playing the same role here in, in some way as Erasmus? I'm, I'm not sure I understand this, because in some sense, you're right. I mean, the... the I mean, uh, just uh, to add one more thing. I mean, you know, you could say, you, you said, like, um, Luther is at some point playing the ordinary language philosopher. Take a look at things how they are, no? Yeah. And Erasmus is somehow what is there, no? And, and he's taking a look at it. Yes, precisely. And what he finds out is that the good guy, uh, the... the, the, the that the guy who wants to be the good guy, the moderate guy, and so forth, ultimately endorses blasphemy, right? I mean, this is, so this, this is Luther's point. Um, Erasmus' position is no position. So he misunderstands himself, and uh, I mean, I, I left out all the polemic parts. Luther is quite funny to read, I have to say. I mean, if you didn't do that, do it. Um, because he begins by saying, yeah, people asked me why it, take, it took me so long to re reply to your criticism. And then he said, not because I was anguished, not because I found it so difficult, but it is so moronic what you have written down. I found it painful to read it. I mean, it's just like you're so stupid, right? And the idea, and I mean, uh, this is super, but the idea is um, it's so moronic because it displays the structure of human reason, right? He, it is human reason incarnated. This is the idea, which is indistinguishable from human stupidity. So what you get is, I mean, an analysis of human reason. So it is, let's, let's put it like that. In each and any of us, we have an Erasmus and a Luther, one could say. Yeah. So, in some sense, this is, I think, the Lutheran claim. Um. Okay, no, uh, next question. Нет, нет. Лёша подлочит женщину. Вот и и потом что? Ну, Лёш. Здравствуйте, спасибо большое. Hello, thank you. Скажите, пожалуйста. Простите, я не понимаю. Надо было подготовить. Я мог бы ответить, но... Я мог бы ответить, но просто не, не воспринимаю пока. Так, секундочку. Okay. Так, так, я слушаю. Слышно? Can you hear me? Yes. А вам не кажется, что вот Don't you think позиция Лютера that Luther's position uh, is quite similar to, 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 to the Hinduist position of, Bo of God as Brahma? So, so like pantheism, so God exists everywhere. And so, so this comparison of love is quite close to Sufism. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 I'm very attentive. I was listening very closely to your speech, and it sounds me to like a bit of a Eastern philosophy. I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a similar issue as with the with the Spinozism question. The whole the whole idea is: is there some, let's say, hmm, stuff, some substance from which all the things are made, um, and which therefore is what is everything? But I mean, take this. I mean, it's not like a polemical definition. Take this uh, definition of man in Luther seriously: the excrement that fell from God's anus. Right? This is the relation. So it's not like, it's not still God. It's his shit, right? I mean, so and in a in a weird toilet world we're living. So we're separated from God, but somehow I mean he was the one shitting us out. Let's put it like that. In this way we're moved by him, but right we're left alone afterwards. So there is a radical difference, and I think this would be different from from uh, Hinduists. Uh, perspective as much as from a Spinozist perspective. This, th this difference, I think, needs to be needs to be emphasized. Right, Alexei. And, uh, 
Chaim, one, one more, uh, just shortly, and, and then no, uh, uh, first. Mm -hmm. Могу я задать вопрос или нет? Да, ты сейчас, да. Потом Хаим Сок. Я хочу попробовать быть коротким, но, знаете, вопросы имеют какой-то как сказать, 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 как сказать,
I mean, which is the Eichmann position, right? Um, you're just the, the agent of the other's desire and will, and you just act them out. This needs to be avoided. And I think Luther avoids it because we will never know what God desires. I mean, this is why the uh, prohibition to speculate on, on God's wishes is absolutely crucial. And th this is where predestination enters, right? So in some sense, to avoid thinking in politics that we're just the agents for the movement of history that we somehow know is Lutheran predestination somehow. One can avoid such an interpretation. Sorry. Okay, uh, we are desperate, uh, desperately running out of time. Not, not even no time to be hu uh, human. There is no time to be inhuman. But the very last uh, question, uh, please super short and super short reply and we immediately pass to the next. Thank you very much. I, I will speak English. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, um, let me add uh, some Jewish point of view on this question. Of course, I don't pretend uh, uh, to to give a, a holistic uh, position, Jewish uh, of Judaism on, on these uh, issues, but uh, some uh, short points. Uh, 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 I think we, from Jewish or Judaistic uh, the point of view. We can define the God, whatever we can, uh, but, uh, and we don't know the God's will, but he left commands and agreement. Yeah, so uh, the a human being should follow the agreement. And uh, um, in this sense, I think this is the, um, uh, the basis uh, or the, the, the early uh, background for capitalism, yeah? But, uh, of course, not, not the same, because the uh, ethical commands, uh, they, they, uh, um, uh, they lead to <coughs> some uh, ethical society, yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, this is not an agreement that you will follow the commands, and then I will give you whatever you want. Mm. But if you w will follow the commands, your life will be fine, not because of me, but because you, you do it right. Mm. <clears throat> uh, and in, in this sense, <clears throat> uh, 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 Israeli professor, uh, Israeli philosopher, Professor Ishael Leibovitch, uh, called one of his articles, I'm not a humanist, I'm a religious man, he uh, tried to, uh, to prove in this article that all his hum humanistic actions are... Um, um, uh, dictated by, by, by God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, one of the greatest Talmudic rabbis said, I'm, I'm finishing in a, in a minute, that w uh, one, one of the greatest Talmudic rabbis said, uh, uh, everything is expected, Rabbi Akiva, everything is expected, but the choice, and the choice, we can know from Hebrew, but, but and the choice, is given, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think he proved this statement uh, by his own experience when he joined the rebellion, anti-Roman uh, rebellion of Bar Kokhba, and recognized Bar Kokhba as a Messiah. It, it's a very subjective uh, step, yeah, a very subjective decision, which proves his uh, definition of, of free choice, that there is no free choice, but still free choice. Uh, so the, the, um, this uh, matter of subjectivity, of human uh, uh, right to decide in the framework of commands is very important from the Jewish point of view, whatever the God can be. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe just very short. Um, I mean, Luther's position on this is there are commandments, but he's a complete Paulinian in this. I mean, you know that Luther, uh, Paul said, with uh, law there came knowledge of sin, right? And for, 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 for Luther, this means the commandments just demand things that are utterly impossible, and thereby they clarify how incapacitated we are. But, I mean, then it's a different, uh, difficult uh, debate, I think, why this is not an infinite demand in the sense of Simon Critchley and all this 
bullshit. Um, but I, I think, um, in some sense, I mean, the com commandments do only one thing. They make us realize that we're unable to fulfill them or follow them at all. Right? I mean, this is somehow, but okay, thank you. <laughs>